Welcome to Season 2 of You and Me Kid, a podcast about starting and raising a family on your own, where I speak with other single moms, those still considering, and experts in relevant fields to give you a real sense of what the day-to-day experience of solo parenting looks and feels like. So wherever you are in the process, I hope this podcast provides some support, helpful info, and most importantly, humor. Thanks so much for listening. Now let's get to it. On today's episode, I'm so excited to talk to Lindsay. Lindsay's a single mom of a toddler in the Southeast. We talk a lot about the communities that we've built around our families and our kids that really help us to be supported as mothers, as well as continue to feel like ourselves after this big transition. We also get into the details of the daycare options that she considered, sickness in the first couple of years of life, and the ups and downs of international travel. I hope you enjoy my chat with Lindsay. Let's get to it. Well, thank you so much for chatting. And as I'm saying, all the back and forth, one of the things I've been joking about with people about doing a podcast about single moms is the hardest thing is scheduling with single moms. Oh, um, yeah. I we know. just all, you know, don't have a lot of free time, um, especially free time that involves like quiet in the background and no kids kind of climbing all over us. So thank you for your flexibility. I appreciate it. Yeah, um, excited to talk. Lindsay, you're in Nashville. And yep. how old is your son? He is 20 months. 20 months. So, okay. Yeah. And when did this whole thing kind of start for you? The idea of doing this on your own? Uh, probably after I turned 40, I had like a major career transition. I had helped build a nonprofit with a friend. Sort of the building of that just took a lot of my time and energy of my 30s. <laughs> the nonprofit was really for women. And so we had a lot of young interns and I, I loved like gathering them. And that just, it just was like very life filling. So as I sort of left that to go do something else and did some healing work on myself, one of the things that I realized is that I had spent a lot of time building other people's dreams and not really like focusing on my own dreams. And they had kind of just gotten buried in in there. And I remember in my 30s, I had a good friend in Austin that was a single mother by choice. She had adopted her first and then did fertility for her second, did it through IUI. And I went to dinner with her when I was in my late 30s. And she was like, you need to go to your gynecologist and get your AMH level tested and do all this stuff. She was like super intense about it. And I was like, I am not there. But it was something after, you know, sort of leaving that organization, transitioning my career and beginning to focus on myself. I was like, I really don't want to miss out on motherhood. So I sort of called her and was like, you're going to think I'm crazy, but no, I'm like in my forties now, but I want to figure out what my options are. So she kind of talked me through just the basics of like, what would the adoption road look like versus what the fertility road would look like and where did it kind of get started? So I made an appointment like in one of the next days with a National Fertility Center just to start talking about my options there. Yeah. So that's the beginning. Yeah. I tell people kind of similar (laughs) things because I think the two big things I feel like folks don't totally realize are the finances involved and kind of once you're on the path, they kind of compound a little bit. So you you do sometimes have to plan ahead unless you're one of those amazingly lucky folks that IUI works on, on the first shot, right? Totally. Or you would, you know, adopt and you, and and that is in your, you know, finances. But the other thing people don't totally get is the process takes a while. And it's not just like, it's like, I'm a realtor. So it's not like, let's decide on a Monday, we're going to look for a house. And on Saturday, we're going to get it. It's all timed around your cycle. It's timed around the availability of the doctor. I mean, sometimes it's six weeks just to get the first appointment. And then you wait another six weeks for your cycle to start for blood work. And so kind of getting the ball rolling sooner than later is one of the things I've kind of been telling folks, because it just takes a long time to get all the pieces in order. In addition to that is that I think a lot of people are scared of like, how am I going to do this? And sort of planning out sort of problem solving for this future life. And there's so many opportunities to say no along the way. That that was like really helpful for me to know is like, you make an appointment 
does this feel right? Do I want to keep pursuing this? And they kind of lay out your options. And so you pursue one option and you might hit some roadblocks and then you have to pursue another. So it was like, there were a lot of yeses, you know, and places where I could have very easily bailed out. And I think that one of the things that was helpful for me in the process was really having a posture of it being about trying. You know, I was like, I want to pursue motherhood. I knew that it was sort of out of my hands to make it happen, you know, but I wanted to do everything I could do that I was comfortable with financially and, you know, emotionally. And so it was like, I just kind of kept being like, do I want to keep doing this? Like, is this still feel like the right thing? And and that was really helpful because I think if I had been laser locked on, like, I'm going to do whatever it takes to become a mother that I could have ended up in tons of debt and, you know, like just a lot of disappointment too. It was like, I just kind of had to keep trusting the process as we say it on site where I work, trusting myself and my intuition and like what I was up for. Yeah. Hey guys, thanks so much for listening to this episode of the podcast. As you know, this season, I partnered up with California Cryobank, the number one sperm bank in the U.S., California Cryobank ships to over 40 countries and has one of the largest and most diverse selection of donors out there. They are offering my listeners an amazing deal for season two that gives you free access to their level two subscription, which lets you check out baby and adult photos of the donors. To use this code, visit cryobank.com or click the link in the episode description and use my promo code YOUMEKID, Y-O-U-M-E-K-I-D, for a free level two subscription to their donor catalog. California Cryobank has helped tens of thousands create the family of their dreams and hopefully you're next. Now let's get back to it. You mentioned something that I think I hear a lot is my, I had a a kind of coach years ago that called it future tripping. Yes. You're you're 15 steps ahead, making a decision that's going to look really different in step 14 than it does now. Like you, you can't go there yet. Yeah. And, and in this process, you you absolutely nailed it. Everything looks different every step of the way. You have more context. You have more data. You've got different feelings in your heart, in your body, you know, in your community. And so it, you really kind of have to just start and see how you feel each step of the way. Um, and as you said, it's like, it might not feel right. And so then you you pivot, right? Or, or you right. stop altogether, but keep saying yes until it doesn't feel right anymore and, and see what happens. So yeah. what did you decide to do eventually to get pregnant? What was the path you chose? I, you know, I ended up going the fertility path. I had had a lot of friends that have adopted both single and coupled. And I remember one day I was with a lot of my friends who are actually all married, but they were talking about sort of the trauma of adoption. <laughs> and they weren't talking about like the trauma their kids had experienced or like living with their kids. They were just talking about like, our family was one way one day. And then the next day it was totally different. And it was just a really hard thing for them to reconcile, even though it it was like expansive and better in a lot of ways, just the quickness of the change and the magnitude of the change was just like a lot for them to process. Without that and 10 month runway. Without, you know? yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, it's like you yeah. just you know, it's like, you don't know if they're coming home and then all of a sudden they're there. And I just remember observing the conversation and thinking, I have been single. I've had all this autonomy and independence my whole life. You know, I have had dogs, but that's been sort of my, my responsibility uh, in a job. I was like, I'm going to need a gestation period to like really prepare myself for this. So that was one of the major contributing factors that like made me pursue fertility versus adoption. Cause I'm like, I love adoption. I just knew like for my lifestyle and for where I'd been emotionally that like the preparation time would be really helpful of a fertility journey. Yeah, And so that is sort of what pushed me in that direction. So went to Nashville Fertility Center. I did um, an IUI. I planned to do a series of those, but I had some cysts and some fibroids that were causing problems with me taking the medication. And so the way that they do it at Nashville Fertility Center is they had a basically like a waiting list for donor embryos. Um, And so from my first appointment, I had put myself on that waiting list 
for the donor embryos. And so I was doing IUIs while I was on the waiting list. And then once I kind of realized that that wasn't going to be realistic pathway for me, I was like, I'll just wait until an embryo comes up. And so um, I, they called me like six months later, which was, I think in March of 2020. (laughs) And I was like, I feel really scared to do this right now. You know, I was like, I just, I can't. And so thankfully they let me wait a couple of months. um, And I think I reached back out in June and I could start the process. The way that they did it was they had a selection of donor embryos that had come from that clinic and they sort of sent me paperwork on the available embryos. You know, it's sort of like if you've done an IUI with a sperm donor, you get sort of the same kind of information where it's like family medical history. There was a lot more information from the egg donor because I think she had donated her eggs and talked some about even sort of the reason why she wanted to donate her eggs and things like that. So used a donor embryo to get pregnant. And I actually did one transfer that fall and had a chemical pregnancy. And then again, I didn't know if I would like keep going after that. So I really kind of took time to grieve sort of that chemical pregnancy, that miscarriage, then decided that I wanted to try again. And so I did another transfer that spring of 2021 and got pregnant. Oh my God. Wait, I need to back up a step. Sorry. I know it was a lot. (laughs) No, that wasn't a lot at all. I, what I, I'm really fascinated by this donor embryo concept. I've never heard about that before. That's incredible. What an amazing option for folks. When you initially said that it made me think that maybe those were embryos that couples had made together and, and no longer needed to build their families. But it sounds like maybe they were both donors creating embryos together. What's your understanding of that? Well, I think that it's they cut. There are like millions of frozen embryos in the United States from people that have done IVF and then have embryos that are frozen that they're trying to determine if they're going to use, discard, or um, sort of what they do with them, you know, and they're, some of people are just paying the storage fees uh, for those embryos. There are a lot of them out there. And um, so my understanding is that they're either created by a couple or a woman or, you know, like someone that is sort of creating them to use them. And then they end up not using them and they're left, left over. And so I think Nashville Fertility Clinic was trying to figure out, like, how can we funnel these to people that want or need them? And so they have that within their clinic that they offer. I know that there are also like, I think, Facebook groups where you could find embryos, some adoption agencies um, sort of have an adoption process for embryos. Yeah. It's really interesting. What a beautiful option. I had no idea. I was never given that option. My fertility clinic must not have had it or. um, Yeah. I don't know. I guess it never came up, but that's amazing. I love that. Okay. So you, you had your donor embryo. Your son is 20 months. Yeah. Do you own your business or run on site? No, I am the uh, lead the marketing team. Yes. And have been here for about five and a half years. So and it's how- on site is an emotional health retreat center. Um, and so we run like therapeutic and personal growth workshops and then have a longer term residential trauma treatment center called milestones. Incredible. What an amazing, yeah, I love have, it. especially as a mama, how did those first few months, you know, did you take maternity leave? How did you balance new mamahood with work? I took maternity leave. Um, I did all three months. Yeah, it was definitely, it feels like such a blur. You know, when you're in it, you're like, how am I ever going to get past this? And now it's like, you really do forget about sort of the survival of those days. Um, But I, yeah, had a great support system. I have a lot of uh, friends that are like family in Nashville that sort of all came alongside me and sort of, I had two of my closest girlfriends were uh, in me for labor and delivery. 
they're the two godmothers. And so I, I kind of laugh. Ben is like a community baby, you know, <laughs> I like pay the bills for him and take care of him, but he is like so well loved. And, you know, now that he's talking a little bit in the same words, like 60% of his vocabulary is like people's names that he loves. Aww. And so like in the car on the way to school would be like, who all loves you? And he'll just list, you know, like my Nini, who's like one of my best guy friends, mothers and Gaga and Papa, which are my parents. And then um, all, my, all my friends. So it's really cute. But That's so yeah, sweet. Got through oh my- it with the help from my friends for sure. Yeah. Oh man. That just gave me goosebumps a little bit. Cause I feel the same way about my daughter. We just yeah. have this amazing community of support and and somebody was asking me if she had ever went through like a stranger danger phase. And I kind of laughed like it was like, it, no, because in our world, it's like if all those people can't hold her and snuggle her and play with her, we, it would just be such a different life for us. So I think she's yeah. just so used to between childcare and all of our friends spending time with us. She's just used to so many different faces and starting to recognize people and build relationships with them. And, and yeah. I just, I love it so much. It's, it's yeah. everything and more that I ever thought it would be. Yeah. And Ben is in daycare now. Okay. He got in like right at a year. And before that I had like had a nanny at the house. Um, Nashville like was way backlogged on getting kids, especially infants into daycare. And so um, that just was not an option. He was on like seven wait list and you have to like pay you know, $150 to put them on each wait list. And then you never it's get insane. that money back. It's crazy. Yeah. It's so, crazy. Yeah. It's absolutely crazy. But so he's in now, how is the first is year of daycare going? The germs are real. They are real. Um, we definitely have had, I think everything like, you know, like the first month yeah. we both had like a respiratory infection that lasted weeks. And then Mother's Day, I was visiting my sister and he had sores that started appearing, which I just thought was like a pacifier rash. And we realized it's hand, foot, mouth disease. Yeah. Yeah. We've had COVID. We've, you know, we've, we've had it, but it. um, it really has been so good for him and for me, like just the continuity of daycare. I think it was so wonderful having a nanny and kind of having him at home. So I got to interact with him some during the days during that first year, but then transitioning into daycare where he's like surrounded by kids his age. Um, he was like a really late walker. And so just, just having the other kids around that like are cheering him on and they're learning things. And it's so fun now to like, discover the things he knows that I haven't taught him, you know, it's oh, really, yeah. So, um, it's great. Do you work from home? I work, uh, we have an office in Nashville and then okay. a campus that's about an hour outside of Nashville. So I kind of do a little bit of both those, but, and I can be home. It's really flexible, but I do better with people around. Yeah. The Same. It's a good balance. Coworkers. When I'm yeah. in my house, I feel like I'm constantly like, oh, I should do laundry or I know. I'm looking exactly. around like I should do this thing or that thing or not focus on whatever I'm trying to procrastinate about. So it's exactly. good for me to be out of the house as well. Um, okay. I'm dying to talk to you about traveling with Ben. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You have had some pretty amazing adventures together. It looks like, and I am yeah. just in that phase with now a 14 month old where I'm We've flown a handful of times domestically, but I'm just getting to that stage of kind of wondering when I start, how we do it, what are the logistics. And I feel like one of the biggest things that I thought about prior to having a baby was how am I going to keep up that part of my life that's so important to me, um, whether whether it be domestic or, or global travel. So tell me, like, when did you guys kind of start kind of making those bigger trips together and how did it yeah. go? I, you know, it was funny. I realized sort of, as my maternity leave was like closing up, I was like, I, before I go back to work, I want to like use this time to like see some close friends and family. And so I did a road trip to Birmingham, which is like three hours from Nashville um, and saw one of my best friends and stayed with her for a couple of days. And then a few days later, we flew to Raleigh, North Carolina, where my sister lives. And I stayed with her for a couple of days. And really, it, they both kind of felt like practice runs. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's little, like I just trying to figure out like point. how to yeah. do it and what Get you need security. and what you don't how, need. Yeah. And, and he was like seven, six or seven weeks old. 
you know, and the thing about traveling with babies that are under two, I can't speak for the ones that are over is that generally people are really nice, you know? And like when they're screaming on a long haul flight, there will be moms that will come out to you and been like, we've been there. It's okay. You know? And you're like, the world is not all awful. So the thing that I've realized about traveling, which I knew just from my own experience, but then watching it with a child is that we really grow when we're out of our comfort zone. And so we, my family did a like two week trip to Italy this summer. I swear in those two weeks, Ben grew like leaps and bounds. Like we, he left a little baby and came back a boy. And it just was so cool to hard and so cool, so hard, but so good to like stretch out of our comfort zone, be more flexible on schedules, like just see what they could handle kind of in that setting. Um, I was so anxious going in. I had no idea what to expect, which I think is probably the right way to go in. I didn't have this idea that it was going to be like this perfect, serene experience. You know, I was just kind of like, we're going to try this and it could be a mess. Yeah. Um, but we're in but Italy. It was great. It's a mess but in we're Italy. in Italy. It's yeah. a mess in Italy. And we're traveling with people that can help and are going to be understanding of the fact that we've got a 18 month old baby yeah. with us, you know? Yeah. When I, I remember my very first flight with her and, and, and our first two flights, two or three flights, she was pretty little as well. So it almost like, it's not that it doesn't count when they're that little, but they do snooze quite a bit. Yeah. And they're so like, you could just kind of throw them wherever and they can nap in your lap. And I felt the same way, first of all, that I've never felt like more people had offered to help me through the whole process. I mean, strangers right. through security, the security guards, I felt like in every airport I've been in have been really helpful and and kind. People are always offering to like hit the button on the stroller or, you know, um, flight attendants on my last flight were like, hey, do you want me to hold the baby while you get settled? in the seat, just little stuff like that. And and I've gotten used to saying, yes, you know, it yeah. would be great. Um, especially now that she's over a year and like in that super wiggly stage. I remember that first flight though, just thinking through the logistics of like, okay, what's in the bag? What do I need to get to? And I remember sitting in the chair, having the bag under the seat and realizing my, like my setup was wrong. Right. Yeah. Because I was like, okay, how do I make a bottle with a baby in my lap? Like, how am I going to do this? Right. And so the second flight, I kind of switched up my program a little bit. I like pre poured water, you know, I had, I had some tricks of the trade and you kind of get your system set up. I think I switched bags to a different bag. The bag matters. The bag matters. So now we've got our system a little bit more dialed. Um, and I think now I'm the domestic, we've only done flights that were like a couple hours long. So the fact that you just took a baby to Italy, I'm, I'm in awe of you. Um, and wondering kind of what you, how you did that. Like, what was the planning? Cause people are always telling me there's a bulkhead bed thing or like, yeah. what were, how'd you guys do it? So he, again, Ben was at, he was like 18 months when we left. And so I knew that like, he probably wasn't going to fit in the bassinet. So I got him his own seat um, for the, I, if we're traveling domestically for like a two hour flight, totally going to keep him in the lap and save my money until he's two. But for the long haul flight for my own sanity, I got him his own seat. And then I got this inflatable, it's called the flyaway bed. Oh yeah. I've seen that. I think they, it's like inflate social and, media. It looks cool. Yes, yeah. You're definitely going to get more ads now than we've talked about it, but it basically like inflates and takes from like the back of the seat to the, to the seat in front of you. So, and it's like just an inflatable little bed. And I would say more than getting it as a bed, I knew from traveling before that I needed some th- way that he couldn't throw all his toys on the floor. Oh, so it's like a play area. So it also. helps kind of like just give them space that feels a little more contained. Yeah. So it like, w- that was like a huge win because I, I felt like the last fight we had done before that, his passy was on the floor every two minutes. He was just throwing yeah. everything on the floor yeah. and it was driving me crazy. So he did great. He stayed contained. He did not sleep on the plane over, which was an overnight flight at all. So that was like a lot, but... 
a, a friend afterwards like what movies did you watch your flight and I like laughed I'm like that is not like I was just like hyper vigilant like how do we make keep this baby happy um and he still was like young enough that he wasn't into screens you know or like he couldn't sit and watch right watch something so it was like a rough. tough yeah. age to be flying with him at um I think even now he's like enough into Lama Lama that I think I could keep him just like <laughs> binging yeah. on on tvs or whatever but did you crash when you guys got there how did the it was great because he was so tired that he just we all just got right on the schedule because we were just exhausted yeah yeah somehow it all kind of worked out probably don't remember it all fully clearly you know how you just kind of get through and you're You're like like, just wait till we're landing yeah but, um, and I had, I would say the other thing was I had scheduled flights. My sister does not live in town with me, but we like met up in Chicago and then flew over together. So she and my nieces were on the long flight with me, which awesome. was great because then I felt like I could leave him with her if I needed to go to the bathroom. Yeah. Um, even like having them be in the seats behind us, he could stand up and talk, like kind of babble at them and talk to them and stuff like that. So, yeah. How were your, um, how were your fellow seatmates with the whole situation? Um, th- well, it helpful? was nice because nice, we had that family, have... the family shield was around us. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I would say generally everyone was okay. You know? Yeah. What I remember about pre-baby life is even as someone who loves kids, right? And so I always, even if there was a mom who had a screaming baby, it was, I almost, I almost just always felt bad for them, right? I was never yeah. really annoyed and not everybody's like that, right? Um, but I think when it's not your baby, the the most it could ever it be is way. like, gosh, I wish I was taking a nap and this baby's crying. Like it, it's yeah. never that big of a deal, but we make it such a big, I make it such a big deal sometimes if Ellie's crying. I feel bad for everyone around me. Right. And totally. I've started to get really good about just not taking that on. That's great. I'm yeah. feeling 10 times more than they're feeling. They don't really care. Yeah. They're getting to their destination. They don't have kids. They're, right. you know, have a cocktail. They're watching a movie with their earphones. Like they're fine. And so just kind of focusing more on us and not worrying about, not worrying yeah. about the the larger group, like at a restaurant on a plane is something that I've had a harder time just yeah, try I think to as long as you're I like, thought, yeah, trying to like engage and discipline your child. I think yeah. that's what I always remember being a single person was like, if somebody's like kid was like kicking the back of the seat and they yes. weren't, you know, they just seemed oblivious or they were like doing their own thing and letting their kid sort of ruin my experience. Right. But they couldn't be bothered with it. That kind of bugged me. And yes. so, I mean, even now it's like, I definitely go out to dinner a lot with Ben. It's like, I definitely am engaging him and not expecting someone else to do it for me, you know, right. right. And disciplining him and that kind of thing. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Wow. So he didn't sleep the whole way over. You guys stopped in Chicago and then did you do Chicago to Rome to Rome? Wow. That's a long, yeah. And then we had a couple hour drive because we were going to Tuscany to uh, a small town in Tuscany to stay. And then from then on out, was it just, Typical it was good. Kind like of new schedule every day going with the yeah flow. I mean like I would say we're very regimented in the states generally like he goes to bed at seven he wakes up about seven <laughs> you know like we try to stick on schedule but in Italy like people don't even eat dinner till seven thirty so you couldn't get a reservation like there were not restaurants open so it his schedule was like really thrown out the window like we were he was up to like nine and ten most nights already in but he did. Okay. Like I was shocked. Yeah. Like I, um, I think that doing that with him, I felt like a ton more confident now around like pushing some limits that I wouldn't have known I could push before. Yeah. I just went to Montana for the past five days and it was kind of similar. There were a lot of other kids around. And so my daughter was able to stay up longer because I think that there was a lot going on. Whereas when it's just us, you know, it's, yeah. there's, it's the same old same in the house. Right. So it's time to go to bed, but she, she pushed the times a little bit too. And I was excited about that. Of like, Oh, okay. Maybe there is yeah. some creativity here. If there are things happening and we're not yeah. going to have a full meltdown every single time it gets to be six 30 and, and we're not pushing it, but that's great. That makes me feel great. And I feel like, you know, I one, I mean, one of the things that I've learned the most about motherhood too, is it's just like, 
even if they're having a breakdown, like it's going to end. Right. So the yeah. flight at some point that flight will it's land be over. Yep. And you'll get there. And at some point the jet lag the will go away and, you know, kids probably aren't going to sleep as well on vacation. And that's just a given. And you take it kind of day to day, but the value of the whole adventure is worth it. Yeah. I will say the piece of gear that I felt most dependent on that I would purchase again was the yo-yo travel stroller. Oh, I don't know about that. It's it just like, a super lightweight, like foldable. It folds down and fits in the overhead compartments. And wow. It, like I did so much research on gear. I think that's like how I dealt with my anxiety about like, what do I need to take? And I bought more stuff than I needed. But yeah. that stroller was great. You can carry it over your shoulder. It's got like a little shoulder strap. There's got like a hook for your diaper bag um, to hang on the back of it. It just was like so good. Like it did good on the kind of cobblestone streets of Rome and Florence. And he like would sleep in it some. And so it was great. Did you take the car seat all the way to Rome or did you get one there? I did not take the car seat. The American car seats are like illegal in the EU. And oh. so you can take yours and you're not really going to get a ticket, but um, we had transfers for our big drives. And then, so I used, I, they arranged car seats to have in the transfers. That's so and then helpful. in cabs, you don't actually have to have a car seat, which okay. feels so weird and daunting. Yeah. For like short stints, I just had him, yeah, in my lap. Yeah. I'm just Which I, that. sounds so stressful and I agree. But I then you're like, okay, like whatever works. Like we got to get there. And I wasn't, yeah. there's no way I would have lugged a car seat for like this cab ride from town to like our villa, you know? Right. right. I'm just turning the corner of the car seat that's lighter weight for the smaller baby that can just clip into my stroller to the one that stays in the car and weighs a billion pounds. And I'm thinking through like, okay, how do I get this from the parking lot to the bag check? Like what's my new car seat plan? Um, And trying to think through like, how do I just rent one in places? Cause it's such a hassle to lug that. Yeah, I did. I got a backpack for the car seat that I I just heard about this. Just one from like, throw them in like from Amazon. That I'll use for like, if I'm renting a car, like I'm going to the beach in a couple of weeks. And so I'll take my car seat for that because we're renting a car and I can just put it in there. Have you ever rented a car and gotten a car seat with the rental car? Is that a thing? I have not ever done that. I think you can do that, but I've never done that before. All things that make our lives easier. I will say I've used baby quip a lot for like renting pack and plays, toys, that kind of thing. And that is great. So yeah. they the rent less stuff, all sorts of baby the gear. better, in my opinion. I mean, I only have yeah. two hands to get from the car yeah. to baggage claim. What was his favorite part about the trip? You know, like just the time with my family and like loved being in a new place. Yeah, He loves pizza. So the food in Italy was a hit. We did like a food tour in Rome and he tried everything. He ate like a whole tier, a uh, whole um, cannoli. He ate some tiramisu. Oh he ate porchetta. He ate a fried squash blossom. Like he was like just into and trying at, stuff. Yeah. That's impressive. So, yeah. I think he just, he loves people and new things. And so it, he did great traveling. And I think he's bored kind of at home with just me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Did it take a weight off in terms of like wondering how it would go and now knowing you like you've got it? Yeah, I definitely think like, I feel like oh, I want to keep no, I want to keep yeah. doing stuff with him. You know, like I just think it's good for him and it's good for me. Yeah. It is exhausting too. So I definitely came back tired. Yeah. But cuz it's the no child care for 2 weeks and the different yes. kind of Yeah, it's just a different and, muscle. Yeah. Yeah, I, that's, I'm getting, I'm also kind of getting used to the, it's worth it, but I'm so tired when we get back Yeah, I need a day to like just nap, you know, yeah. nap, shower, laundry, just to like kind of get back in the groove. Um, I, I do think it's like looking at like time off now and thinking about like, how do I do things that are just like rejuvenating for myself versus like 
things that are stretching and time with my family and stuff like that is important. And so in February, I did a trip with just some friends and left been at home with a friend. Um, yeah. And I needed that. Like I needed to be able to sleep in and just be Lindsay, not mama been in for a minute. And so I just think that prioritizing that sort of trip as a single mom is also really important. Yeah, I agree. I, I've also really from the beginning tried to get a nice little roster of babysitters. And even though sometimes it feels like more to get dressed and go out after your kid goes oh, to yeah. sleep and get a sitter, it's so nice. Um, and it's so nice just to have that time and be present with friends and and fill your own cup, as you said. And I've, I have taken a few trips without um, my daughter and um, they've been amazing. I mean, the first morning yeah. when you wake up and you realize you can just roll back over and go to sleep is magic. Um, and then, but, you and know, then you realize you can't sleep and it's, but right, yeah. Right. Yeah. And then I watch her, you know, then I just look at pictures of her in the middle of the night when I can't sleep. Yeah. Um, what's next on the, have you thought about next kind of trips with him? Do you guys, have um, we're call? doing a quick beach trip in a couple of weeks with some um, friends. Um, and then I think next year we'll probably try to do Europe again at some point. I have a, a group of friends that are dreaming about getting over to Italy. So yeah. Do you we might go like back before I had kids? I, I kind of felt like there were my friends started having kids like 10 years ago. I'm 40, yeah. almost 42. So there were, there was kind of this stretch of the past like six years where I was not in the married club. I was not in the kid club. Um, and then there's also like, a, I'm not in a club that can just do whatever I want because I have endless amounts of money club. Right. Right. And so it was a little bit isolating, even though I have this amazing community, it kind of felt like, wait, these groups are shifting in terms of their, their, what they're doing and, and they're doing family trips together, or they're only going with families they met from elementary school or things kind of shifted a little bit. And I, I think it's helped a little bit to have a child, but my daughter's so much younger than most of my yeah. friends' kids at this point too, that now we're on totally different programs. Um, and so I'm craving the multifamily, total chaos, kids everywhere trip. Like that's what I'm feeling like I want the most is just like, let's get everybody together and just roll yeah. the punches and and um, just a little bit more of that, like getting everyone together kind of thing. But it's tough yeah. with kids of different ages and different schedules and naps and no naps and bedtimes what, that are different. And being like just a little bit ahead of it than you are. The thing that I've seen over the last few months is like, I I'm starting to like have like, I'm be drawn more to friends that have kids around my age, you know? And so like Nashville's gotten an influx of people from New York and LA. And so we've got like kind of this infusion of new people all the time uh, in cool. our community. And a lot of them were older having kids. And so yeah. there are like, I just am like realizing I'm on schedule with people that have kids that are like under three. Yeah. And when I can be with them, it feels like a deep breath and an exhale because if I'm doing something with people and all their kids are older, I'm the only one at the pool. That's like, like, having to like watch my kid eagle eye and you know like he can't play with them fully and so yeah I'm with you and craving it but it is cool to watch it just start to appear as you need it so I think yeah. you'll continue to find more of it where yeah, you the are nap too. times and the bedtimes are the toughest part it's like my daughter yeah. goes to bed at six so I <laughs> you know I no longer can do the thing or go out to the dinner but um yeah, I love that. And I'm feeling that a little bit too, that as she gets older, we'll meet families that have kids our own age and, and kind of find our adventure crew a little bit, yeah. you know? Um, and you guys, um, so Europe next year, he's in daycare right now. Is that five days a week? Five days a week. Yeah. They're open from, um, seven 30 to five 30. And so it works pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. The childcare thing is like one of the biggest, I think, pieces. To yeah, so expensive. Just getting the working life back up and going yeah. and, and doing the balance, I think. 
Yeah. You mentioned earlier, you have some single mom by choice friends. Did I hear that right? I do. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. I, I didn't cool. know anyone got, who had done this. I had um, a friend that had done it before me that kind of helped guide my path. And then um, I, it's, it's fun in Nashville. I have a group kind of that we get together that are all single mothers by choice. One fostered and ended up adopting her foster child, um, another adopted an infant and then me that did the fertility stuff. And then I had a friend that just had a baby earlier this week through fertility stuff that's single. I have another friend that is pregnant that is due in October that's single. So it's just been neat. I've been really public about my journey on social media because I'm like, I just want women to know this is an option for them. And then like want people to find each other because it really is a little bit of a different journey and there's learnings in it. So I'm so glad you're doing this podcast. Yeah, it's been really fun. And I feel the same way. I think even with fertility, the more I started talking about just, you know, going through all the steps of that, right. More people that I already knew became more open about what they'd gone through, which they hadn't talked about with me before. Um, And now I'm sure you do, you know, calls and emails with folks who are thinking about this, who don't know where to start and are reaching out. And so I, I am feeling like this community, maybe I'm just new to it, but I feel like I'm having more and more of these chats and I'm hearing more and more from people like, Oh, I know someone that's doing that. Or I have a friend that was thinking about it. And so, um, it makes me feel great that it doesn't feel like, you know, something that you can't do or that you're giving up on, marriage or partnership or something because you're choosing this path. Cause I think a lot of women feel that way for sure. Totally. Have you dated at all since then? Not. Or is that even no. something that's on your radar at all? I, I mean, I would love to meet a man and, you know, like find the right person, the right person um, in quotation marks, whatever that <laughs> means. But I just, I was never a good like online dater before. Um, I've never been good at having jobs that put me sort of working with a lot of men. (laughs) So I just kind of sucked at dating, honestly, and haven't been good at doing the work of dating. But I feel like I, my friends that are successful in it really invest time and energy into it. And I have other things that I've invested time and energy into. Yeah. Um, And right now life feels so full that I don't have the extra time or energy to invest. Um, But good for you. I invested I would love a lot to meet of time somebody and energy at some point. and it didn't get me anything. So good for you for not, you, well, you save that energy on good things. I don't know. Um, I feel the same way. You know, I, I have had a, a handful of people who I meet and it's usually kind of friends of friends or at dinner parties who assume that I don't want a partner. Like they make those statements, yeah. right? Like, oh, that's so cool that you like, you know, didn't want to get married. And so you did this on your own. And they're two totally different decisions. And it's interesting to me that that assumption is made when in yeah. fact, that's not true at all. I would be yeah. thrilled to find a partner, but I, you know, I, it, it's icing I, on the I, cake I, now, not a means to an end. Yeah. And I do think there are like things that are really hard being the only parent, you know, the only set of hands, the only, but yeah. there also is, there's an ease to being the sole decision maker in some ways Big around time. parenting. Yeah. And so I think it, that is a trade off that a lot of times people don't talk about that kind of. So yeah. I, I, I just feel that, know that way all the time. Watching friends navigate like sleep training together. And I'm like, oh, Ben and I just got on a schedule together. We had yeah. to. So yeah. it just is funny. But that was one of the biggest surprises I think for me was not really feeling in the first year. Like I wish there was another person there. Like I kind of expected to kind of have those moments of God, I wish I, you know, I wish someone was in this with me or I wish I had a partner. And I didn't really feel that way. In fact, it was more of what you just said, which is realizing those moments where you could have gotten resentful or frustrated with one another, right? Because it's 2 a.m. or we're making a big yeah. decision and it's about another relationship eating or up. bottles or yeah. formula or whatever, right? Where one person's read one book and the other person's read the other book. And you just kind of do whatever you want whenever you want because it's just the two of you. And yeah. there is an ease to that. I have really felt that for sure. Yeah. Ugh, I love that for you guys. And I am so grateful for your time. And I would love to just keep hearing about Ben. You're right in front of me. So it's like, I'm going to watch you on Instagram and kind of watch yeah. and, and be inspired by you a little Vice bit ahead of me in the process. I love that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lindsay. I'm so grateful. Thanks so much for listening to today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. 
For more information about the podcast or me, go to unmekidpod.com. See you soon. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you or your company are looking to jump into the podcast world, now is the time. The Plug Agency is here to connect you to the full power of podcasting. You just record and leave the rest to us. The people are listening and want to hear from you. Theplug-agency.com. That's theplug-agency.com. Click the link in the episode description for an exclusive offer.